the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, highly specialized torpedo bombers, triathlon, comparing top light tanks and metal beasts, daring competitor to MBTs. Top-tier ground battles are usually populated by modern main battle tanks. They have powerful engines, guns with high penetration, and all-seeing electronic devices. Very few machines can become worthy opponents to them. And today we're going to talk about one such vehicle, the American HSTV-L. It's been featured in Metal Beasts before, but a lot of changes have happened since then. Let's take a look into what its futuristic design stores inside. Its main weapon is a two-plane stabilized 75mm gun with elevation angles between minus 17 and plus 45 degrees. The ammo for the gun is placed in mechanized racks in the center of the hull. The driver and the gunner's seats are in the front. The commander sits in the turret and the engine compartment is in the rear. The machine also has smoke launchers and a thermal integer. The tank's main feature is an amazing rate of fire. No matter what your crew skill level is, you can send a new round into the enemy every 1.5 seconds, keeping this fire rate right up until all 26 shells are depleted. Of course, its 75mm APFSDS rounds, the XM885, can't match the performance of 105 or 120 mm calibers, but it can still penetrate enemy sides well enough. Besides firepower, this tank also has a high level of mobility and a moderate size. Thanks to that, you can reach good positions at the beginning of a battle quickly and quietly, have an element of surprise when you attack, and then retreat from retaliation. There's another suitable role for this tank, supporting allies on the front lines. You can help them with repairs, do reconnaissance, and crucially, deal critical damage to enemy armor. While the most rapid-firing MBT sends a single shot, this American can respond with three, more than enough to damage the gun and tracks of the hapless opponent. You might find the survivability of this vehicle pleasantly surprising. The front armor plates have such a sharp angle that even an APFSDS round can ricochet, and having the gunner in the hull makes the right side of the turret basically unmanned. Still, it doesn't mean you should try to soak up round after round in battle. A light tank is a light tank, and surviving a hit is a nice bonus, not a foundation for your tactics. The machine has many advantages. Thermals, quick reverse, smoke launchers, commander controls, a laser rangefinder. But what pushes this tank to the top is its gun. With a fantastic depression of minus 17 degrees, you get a reliable aiming position in most cross-country areas, while the lightning rotation speed of 57 degrees per second gives you an ability to control multiple directions in dynamic urban combat. This unusual combination of design features produced a unique machine that can be a match for versatile and powerful top MBTs. The whole deal was odd and seemed unusual for Japanese air forces. Their naval dive bombers with tail dragger gear were pretty eager to open fire in frontal attacks. This amazing surprise wouldn't last long, the Americans <laughs> probably thought. The Japanese military would soon recognize the issue and add at least a single hull-mounted machine gun. That would increase their survivability and make hunting them much harder. But Days passed, then weeks, then months, 
The Battle of Midway saw the best Japanese aircraft carriers sink, but no USAF pilot, cruiser, destroyer, or boat ever saw a B-5N equipped with machine guns or cannons. Why? Because it wasn't seen as an issue by the Imperial Royal Navy Command. When the first prototype Tenzan made its maiden flight back before Pearl Harbor in the spring of 1941, it had no fixed armament either. By 1943, the engineers did add a single machine gun to the wing of the first B6N1 planes. But when the Royal Naval Air Service officers learned of it, they were very upset and demanded its immediate removal. So all later Tenzen modifications had no fixed armament either. As for the regular Japanese pilots, well, we can't know if any of them dared question whether a machine gun was necessary. Even if they did, who'd have listened to them? Soldiers and NCOs are must fight with the fire in their heart rather than share their incompetent opinion. Adding a gun wouldn't have made the machine too heavy or too clumsy or short-ranged. They didn't even have any shortage of machine guns. The reason why their planes were armed like that had to do with the caste culture of Japanese society. Everyone should know their place and mind their own business. Fighter aircraft must fight in the air battles and use their powerful guns there. Dive bombers must perform ground attacks, so they only need some machine guns, and that's enough. A torpedo bomber's task is to bring a torpedo to a large enemy vessel. Aircraft cannons or machine guns are useless against such enemies. Why install them then? If torpedo bombers are attacked by enemy aircraft, you need to go back to step one, the one about fighters' missions. Everyone should do exactly what they're told to do. And history showed what devastating losses Japan had to bear for this decision. No matter how good their flight performances were, the B-5N, nicknamed Kates, and the B-6N, nicknamed Tenzans, were easy prey for the crews of the Dauntlesses, Devastators, and Avengers. The Japanese command did realize their mistake eventually. A later torpedo bomber, the Aichi B-7A, received two aircraft cannons. <laughs> but that's a story for another time. Today's Metal Beast section was dedicated to a top light tank. Why don't we also take a look at its competitors, compare them and have a test? No flashy wheeled vehicles this time, just good old tracked classics. Please welcome the participants. The already familiar HSTV-L for the United States, of course. The TAM 2C from Germany the 2S25M Sprut from the Soviet tech tree, and the CV90120 sent from Sweden. Only a few competitors today, but they're all dead serious about winning. The first stage will have our crews demonstrate their machine's mobility in a range of environments. Getting ready... Go! The American tank gains a lead right away. Then we see the Swede and the Sprut, while the Tam lags a little. By the end of the first area, the Soviet and Swedish machines catch up with each other, and both tanks go head-to-head -head in the dunes. The snowy field brings no change. The American tank is still leading, but the marshy area shortens the gap. And now the TAM is fighting for silver. And uh, here's the finish line. The HSTV-L expectedly comes first. The silver goes to the Swedish tank. But look what happens next. The Sprut hits its speed ceiling, and the TAM steals the bronze at the last moment. Now the second stage will bring an air threat to our contestants an enemy attack helicopter. 
Hitting a maneuvering air target is a tricky task, and the winner needs to do it first. The Sprout crew starts with loading an ATGM right away. A launch some four kilometers away. Some waiting, and a fireball is seen where the heli <laughs> used to be. No other crew has ATGMs, so they have to carefully aim their finned rounds. The American machine's high rate of fire makes its rounds look like a volley, and it takes no time to hit the target. Then the Swedish tank reports success. Its high muzzle velocity definitely helped. The TAM needed the longest, but finally managed to down the heli, earning fourth place. And now it's time to shoot some tanks. This time we'll choose top British challengers for targets, setting the distance to two kilometers. One of them will face the rounds with the front, the other with its side. Let's go. The Swedish crew wastes no time aiming and hits the first target with a single shot. Five seconds later, the next round destroys the second challenger. Well, no surprise with these APFSDS rounds. The American tank has none of those, but it can shoot every 1.5 seconds. A couple of hits set the first target on fire, but the other one takes a little longer. The Sprout and the Tam crews need still more time. Their rate of fire and firepower are good, but not that good. Let's start the award ceremony. The bronze is shared by the 2S25M and the TAM 2C. They lack some mobility and rate of fire. The silver goes to the Swedish CV 90120. Its good mobility and reload rate coupled with a devastating main caliber, make it a very dangerous enemy. But it's still lacking the unique features that the American HSTV-L has. The reload time of 1.5 seconds and the best dynamics bring it the undisputed victory in today's competition. The crews went away to pose for the pictures, as usual, and we're going to answer some of the questions you asked us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Gene Lit. So, can you speak about the settings that show the ammunition left in my weapon in air battle? Hi, Gene. If you want to see remaining ammo at all times, go to Options, Battle Interface, and choose Always in the Ammo Indication menu. RKX023 asks, what is the highest penetration in the game? Hi there. The highest penetration rate among tanks belong to the Leopard 2A60's APFSDS round, the DM-53 652mm. As for the APCBC rounds, the best one is found on the Italian battleship Dante Alighieri, 674mm, and that's from a full kilometer away. Now, the overall record in penetration in War Thunder belongs to anti-tank guided missiles, the 9M123 and the AGM-114K. Their result is 1,200 millimeters. Another question comes from Madman206. Can you tell me if you can use a rangefinder on older tanks, for example, the Tiger H1? And if you can, can you show me how, please? Hey, Madman. You can use the rangefinder on any tank. All you need to do is bind a key of your choosing in controls, ground vehicles, miscellaneous, rangefinder. Its accuracy and ranging speed will depend on the vehicle, though. Laser rangefinders are the quickest. Chunky Bird writes, can we get a 3.0 fighter triathlon? Hi there, Chunky Bird. We've already had this exact triathlon back in episode 148 of the shooting range. It's still available. 
We don't want to repeat ourselves, so we'll find some fighters from neighboring BRs for a new competition. And the last comment for today was written by the American Hat. Can you showcase the different sizes of bombs, ranging from the PE-8's monstrous Fab 5000 all the way down to some of the smaller bombs? Hello, American Hat. We first wanted to handpick a few to show you, but then we thought, eh, why don't we show all of the bombs? Here they are, from the smallest to the biggest. Well, again, that's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Yeah, I know, I know. I say this every week. Don't forget to wear a mask and wash your hands, because I know some of you are quite grubby. Oh, sorry. Uh, since we're all in the midst of the pandemic, I guess you should wash your hands, etc. And afterwards, press the like button. Share your thoughts and comments. And see you next week.